So let me introduce our uh, contestants today. Uh, at the far end there, politically or otherwise, we have Rich Hickey, the author of Closure. He's an independent soft, yes, yes, okay. Enough of that, enough of that. Uh, he's an independent software designer, consultant, and application architect with over 20 years of experience. And he's worked in all kinds of stuff, actually, uh, from scheduling systems, broadcast automation, uh, audio analysis, and fingerprinting, so be careful. Um, database design, yield management, and so forth. Next, we have uh, Jeremy Askinas, and I apologize for all this page flipping. So Jeremy works for the interactive news team at uh, the New York Times, as well as he's the lead developer for Document Cloud, which helps news organizations analyze and publish the preliminary source documents behind the news. Not to be confused with WikiLeaks, I'm presuming. Um, <laughs> He also created <laughs> he also created CoffeeScript, the uh, which uh, yes CoffeeScript yes, um, and he's worked with a number of really great tools in JavaScript that I've had the privilege to use like Backbone JS, uh, Underscore JS, Stoco, Jamit, and Ruby Processing among other things. Next is uh, Gerald Sussman, and contrary to popular belief, uh, he was not made in Martin Minsky's lab in 1964 from surplus <laughs> radio parts. Uh, nor was he part of a freshman project in artificial intelligence. He was indeed <laughs> born. Um, but he was actually an undergraduate as well as now a professor at MIT, and he's been there since 1964, which apparently makes him a lifer. Um, and he's worked on an amazing number of things from artificial intelligence, languages, architectures, and even like physics and astrophysics. And as a recovering physicist, I actually have a copy of his structure and interpretation of classical mechanics, which like an idiot, I forgot to bring with me to have him sign. Um, he's also uh, supervised many students, uh, and he's uh, well-renowned in uh, National Academy of Sciences and all that. He's, and he's also interested in watchmaking, clock making, and uh, amateur telescope making, among other things. And of course, you all know that he wrote Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs with Hal Abelson and Julie Sussman. Yes. All right. Alan Wurstbrock is uh, the Mozilla Research Fellow, and he currently spends most of his time thinking about the future of JavaScript, which is a great thing to be thinking about because it's so hot. Uh, he was the project editor for the ECMA Script 5, and whenever I see that written, I always think it should be pronounced Eczema Script. Um, <laughs> he's also a reformed small talker who, uh, uh, as he puts it, uh, was at the technical, he was a technical and entrepreneurial leader during its slow rise and rapid descent. <laughs> as, a, as a mainstream programming language, yes. And I remember Uppsala 95 when that happened. Um, Which one? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was more the decline side then. Oh, yeah, um, but he has, he has been involved in language implementations uh, and he's done a lot of work, everything from like virtual memory hardware to writing business applications using RPG. All right. Joe Palmer is uh, one of the lead developers on the F-Sharp project. He's been at Microsoft for six years now. I was talking to him earlier. He used to live in Manhattan and then uh, moved to the rainy Northwest. And you have to give Microsoft credit. They've really embraced functional programming and, and provided really first-class support for the language. So that's something that we can all be thankful for. And last but not least is uh, Andre Alexandrescu, who is um, responsible for co coining the term uh, modern C++ used to describe you know, the ways that we should be using C++ today, and that is not an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote a book called uh, Modern C++ Design, Generic Programming, and Design Patterns Applied, and he's worked a lot with Herb Sutter on kind of evangelizing good practices and code standards and things like that. Most recently, though, he's been involved with the D language, sort of working side by side with Walter Bright, the creator of it, and uh, helping design key language features, um, libraries, and so forth. And he has a new book coming out soon called The Deprogramming Language. He also has a PhD from my alma mater, which is the University of Washington. Pardon me? It's already, it's already out? All right, well, rush out immediately and, and pick it up. Um, and he, uh, he's got his BS in double, in double E from the University of Polytechnica in Bucharest. All right, let's give our uh, esteemed panel. <laughs> Okay, so this is what we're going to do. You guys are going to ask most of the questions, but I'm going to uh, use my prerogative to ask the first question. There'll be a couple of people roaming around with mics, and I'll just go back and forth uh, across the room. Uh, so the first question is, what is the capital of Assyria? <laughs> it's Nineveh. Okay, let's move on to the next question, which is, 
What is the worst idea that was ever introduced into programming languages that continues to afflict us today? And how can we make money on keeping it going? <laughs> And please, in any order, feel free to jump in. Go ahead. Ed. Too many parentheses in a programming language. Oh, 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 snap. Oh, snap. <laughs> oh. Well, it's really very hard to find the worst idea because there are so many bad ideas in programming <laughs> languages. Of course, the, um, the ones that bother me most are the ones that are designed to keep me from doing what I want. As after all, I'm a libertarian programmer, okay, and so I, I don't want anybody to tread on me. But the worst features of languages that I can think of, the really worst thing, is complex syntax. Okay, and <laughs> the, as, as Alan Perlis quipped, syntactic sugar yields cancer of the semicolon. Okay? <laughs> One, the problem with complex syntax is that it... Uh, Hides possibly important to understand mechanism, but more importantly, it makes it very difficult to write programs that manipulate programs, that re read them, that write them, that an analyze them, and that, in fact, that's, and in fact, I often have programs that write programs that I want to run in line. For example, numerical programs that are constructed from symbolic uh, algebraic expressions. Okay, so that's the nice feature of, of Lisp, for example, which has lots of parentheses, <laughs> is as uniform representation of programs as data, and the ability to execute a code that you've just constructed. And as a consequence, I would say my, my mantra here is syntax without representation is tyranny. <laughs> uh, I think the worst idea is having um, mutability by default, unlabeled mutability is the worst idea that we still suffer from today. You saw that coming. And to uh, echo a little bit sort of in opposite from Eric Meyer, who yesterday talked about how mathematicians are always coming to the rescue when we run into trouble in uh, programming, I'd like to say that I think that mathematics envy is some of the worst stuff that happens in uh, <laughs> computer science. <laughs> and that the... So um, one of the worst ideas, I think, is um, programming in source files, uh, which almost all the languages we use, but a few languages that have come and largely gone didn't. Uh, so when you write code in a source file, your attention is focused on the organization and structure of the information in that file and how the pieces in the file relate to each other. When you construct code in a small talk environment, for example, you think about the individual abstractions and how they relate to each other, not how the source code is represented. So it's not like there isn't source code behind it and that it's saved and maintained and you can version it, but their focus is directed on the abstractions, not on, not on the notation. Um, I'm trying not to remain so pessimistic about this. I think that's really one of the big problems with programming today is just that I mean, it's actually a great time to be a programmer. You know, we have super fast machines, abundant resources, great languages, virtual machines that make development of new languages, you know, relatively straightforward, relatively straightforward and lower the barrier to entry. Um, but if I had to be forced to pick something, I would say that it's really the focus on code and not data. It's on what we're doing and not what we're doing it for or what we're doing it with. Um, I hope I get the second shot. That was a joke, by the way, right? <laughs> it's, it's understood, okay? Particularly because um, Professor Sussman is here. Um, <laughs> I have, um, um, as, um, as mo mostly a, a sort of um, a software engineer in the trenches, um, uh, my view is that um, much more concrete. I, I totally agree with uh, the complexity, the, t the stance on, on complex syntax or default mutability. Those being taken, uh, in the concrete, I think there are a few um, um, simple minute ideas that are pretty bad and still living today. One would be uh, dynamic scoping, for example, of, of symbols, which is, you know, it's, it's totally anti-modular. And another would be, um, uh, for example, implicit de definition of symbols, like you assign something to symbol, it springs into life, which is the case with many scripting languages. It's not an additional, it's not a big effort to actually uh, define a symbol. Um, with this feature in tow, you get into sort of a typo-oriented programming, which is pretty damaging. 
Well, the correct answer is nulls. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's next? I see a hand back there. We got a mic near him. Daniel? This ought to be good. So what concepts and constructs are the most important to express in a programming language, you know, now and future? What, it, what is really needs to be the focus of programming language design in terms of concepts and constructs? Functions and data. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess we have a winner. <laughs> Functions with data. Oh. oh. Functions as data. <laughs> All right. Any other prepositions you want to slip in there? <laughs> Data as functions. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Next question. Maybe from this side. Anybody over here? Don't be shy. Yes, sir. I can repeat it if we don't have a mic nearby. So if I can paraphrase and correct me if I get this wrong, but he's, you know, Excel is made, is argued to be the most common programming language in the world. For example, very user accessible, but not programmer accessible. So how can we expand? the uh, capabilities of languages like that for reuse and to get some of the benefits that we enjoy as programmers. Is that a fair yes, yes. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't know if you mentioned that I used to work for Microsoft. So it's, um, of course, you're supposed to push your da data into SQL Server and you write ActiveX. Con con <laughs> 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 uh, wrong decade, but uh, uh, so so it's not clear to me that we should expect the same language that's used for for that sort of programming to actually scale to to large scale software engineering projects. I think if you try to do that, you get uh, you get a language and tools that are neither good for the casual programmer nor are they good for the for the professional programmer. So. Um, I think if you need to be able to scale data, I think it's, or, or move information and even algorithms between those, it's important to have defined some sort of, of unit of interchange or encapsulated unit. So in one sense, um, I'm not being totally facetious as saying, well, you need to push your data into SQL Server. In other words, you need to be able to get your data out of those into a form that, that can be accessed by more professional tools. Uh, this week it might be JSON, and but you know some form. And I think you need to be able to encapsulate pieces of algorithmic functionality that can be incorporated into those environments. Hence the ActiveX control. But uh. yeah, I mean I think that there's really there's sort of two problems at play. One is the fact that I mean you have all this data out there and it's structured, and you know there there is sort of a parallels you can draw between the structure of the data and say like what we normally do as programmers in terms of introducing types and modeling programs after types and so there are things that we can do to to sort of make that mapping of data to types more straightforward which would in turn make programming tasks more straightforward as well um, then on the other side of the coin you have well then how can you find meaning in the data right where if it's not specifically about the data or the types the it's about the operations that you perform on the data and then how do you make those operations sufficiently generic where you can map those to multiple data sources that may not have the same ontology say um, and I think all the pieces are at play today to do these things it's just a matter of putting them together I mean you know, we have things like, like JSON, which are, you know, kind of more generalized serialization formats. Um, you know, if you look at the way, like, uh, say, like a, a table-based database is structured, I mean, it's basically there are types there. They're just kind of waiting to get out. And on the other end, you have things like, you know, link and, and other language features that are present today to sort of make walking that data and operating on it more straightforward. So it's really, you know, as language designers, kind of a, um, one of the tasks is to figure out how to sort of coalesce those and make it a more pleasant experience to use those, but still at the end of the day have reusable components that we can leverage elsewhere. So I had one more thought I wanted to add in, and I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, and what, so I think one thing we want to be very careful not to do is impose the concept of types as, as software engineers or computer scientists or functional language designers 
understand them and try to impose that concept upon the casual programmer who's just working with, with, with data and has, has no understanding of those technical concepts and, are, and they're really of no relevance to them. So whether, whether it's uh, types or JSON, um, unfortunately with this particular Excel problem, it's not just a matter of getting your data out. And often cases, if you talk to some people who work for like consulting firms and stuff, they spend all day building immense amounts of code and basically scripting entire applications sort of on top of Excel. So there's a matter of getting the code out as well. Well, one thing it seems to me very important to help people who are manipulating data that are not actual programmers uh, is the ability to, for them to attach provenance information that gets tracked to the data. That's very important for d deep reasons that, in fact, people make mistakes and they have mistakes have to be, un uh, be able to be found and, and fixed. And uh, the other thing I think is important is to prevent terrible disasters like uh, that often occur when you don't have units and dimensions attached to the data. Uh, is another kind of, so you need that kind of extra information, which of course you don't have to put in. I don't want to, again, impose my will on anybody else, but it would be helpful in many cases for that to be the case. And it, um, I, although I am, I'm rather libertarian, I would worry about things like Excel being able to support, sort a column without sorting the, all the, everything correctly and therefore mixing up your data in some horrible way. Uh, from a pure linguistic perspective, um, I, I think, you know, I've seen this uh, at work many times. Essentially, it's, we have this great DSL, domain-specific language, uh, and how do we make it more of a general-purpose language? And always the path is very tenuous because, you know, there are several reasons for it. Um, everybody who's seen a 10,000 lines make file could attest, right? Everybody who's seen a, you know, a 5,000 line script could attest. Um, do you know like visual programming, right? You assemble blocks into programs. You know, how many times have people tried to make those into actually uh, viable propositions for, for the programmer? They never, uh, they never succeeded. We have uh, actually a great uh, research pro project at the University of Washington led by a friend of mine. And essentially, uh, he's been teaching this to undergrads for years, but they've been unable to get, get it from the, from the point where you can actually um, uh, build an RGB color out of three colors uh, to, to the point where it was viable as a, as a programming environment. So I think linguistically, uh, Excel uh, is very good at numerics. Uh, it's uh, pretty bad at typing, uh, uh, referred to uh, the, you know, units, dimensions, dimensional analysis and everything, uh, which is missing. Um, but it's not going to be viable as a, as a programming language uh, in, in the large. And this, this probably gets a little bit away from the actual question that was asked, but gets back to Alan's initial point about how, you know, the worst idea in programming languages is having your code as text, you know, as writing. And I actually think that it's tremendously hopeful and uh, that the fact is that, you know, out of all the fields that should have been revolutionized by computer-assisted design, right, you have architects using AutoCAD to design buildings and you have, you know, even, you know, illustrators and designers using tools like Photoshop to sort of structure um, their drawings and their illustrations and their designs, but programmers still write plain text that you could print out on a printer and read, you know, and understand, and we're not doing it in some sort of computer-assisted fashion. And I think that says a lot about the power of uh, the written word and also the nature of programming in that, you know, if you have the right abstraction, then it's just as convenient for you to say it as a word as it is to have some sort of a visual analysis that can show you where it exists inside of your program. Okay, why don't we take the next question? Quite likely that. I'm going to give you this. It's it's likely that within this decade we'll have computers that have uh, 100 cores and mixed processors, GPUs, vector processors, and so on. Uh, how do we harness this power as programmers? What kind of programs do we write? Okay, um, so, so I have my answer. Um, we already have systems like that. Um, all of us are connected right now into, into such a system, and most of us are building applications that work in the context of such a system that physically they are not on a single chip or in a single box, but they're distributed over wide parts of the world, 
but the fundamental concepts that are involved in building complex web-based app distributed applications can be scaled down to local machines as well as wide area machines. Um, I don't want to jump the gun here. Um, so th this is a difficult problem. You know, as a community, we don't have an answer to it. That would be the short answer. Uh, the longer answer is uh, there's two, uh, th the way I see there's, uh, you know, as Yogi Berra said, there's a fork in the road and we're going to take it. Um, <laughs> so e essentially there's two, uh, there's two prongs to this. One is the distributed aspect of, uh, you know, distributed services and, and computation. And the other is, uh, the, the way I see it is uh, kernels that are highly specialized and doing highly useful work. And uh, by this I'm talking about things like speech recognition, artificial intelligence, machine learning at the, uh, in the large, uh, which are going to actually solve very difficult problems that are of high use to us. For example, imagine you have in your cell phone, I predict within, uh, uh, within uh, the, the, this decade, uh, we're gonna have a, a personal secretary in, inside the cell phone and connected with all the other secretaries virtual secretaries are out there, and you're going to say, what's my next meeting? And, uh, you know, the, the assistant is going gonna, is gonna to answer, you're late, moron, right? <laughs> and, and stuff like that. So, um, essentially, um, speech processing and, and um, natural language processing are extremely high-intensive uh, computation, which can be seen as a large kernel that is going to essentially need to run on a highly parallel machine. We don't know exactly how. Uh, you know, per, um, per Professor Sussman's uh, talk uh, last night, we don't know how to solve it in 10 steps, no matter how slow each step is. We don't know how to do it in 10 steps. We, you know, uh, probably we'll, we'll be able to do it in a few billion steps on, a, you know, on many processors and we'll be happy with that. Uh, so this would, be, uh, this would be the second prong. Uh, highly specialized kernels that do useful work uh, that, that are going, is going to actually impact the way we think about computing. One thing I've been thinking about that I'm a little worried about is the uh, question if we have lots of little disparate machines, of course, as you're suggesting, that are actually specialized to do different jobs, and that's certainly expected. We're going to have to have ways of interconnecting them, which, is, uh, which may not be so easy in the sense that, in the sense that we, we may not be able to agree about the appropriate languages that they talk to each other. So maybe what we need to do is develop methods of establishing protocols dynamically so that the machine, a, two, two pieces of machinery can learn to talk to each other in the same sort of way that, in the same way that probably different parts of my brain have learned to talk to each other when I was about maybe one year old. I thought soap was going to solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> no. uh, <clears throat> without leaping so quite terribly far ahead, I think the very first thing we need to uh, do as collectively as programmers is to stop telling the computer how to do things. That's absolutely the very next thing we have to do. No matter what we do after that, if we, if we do that, uh, we've now separated the problem of distributing and parallelizing things from the tasks we're trying to accomplish. So we have to stop telling the computer how to do things. Okay, do we have a question over here, maybe? Yes. So as language creators, which language do you, other than your own do you wish you had created? So if I can say that for the cameras, so, uh, which language other than your own do you wish you had created? <laughs> Go ahead. There's only one answer, really, Lisp. I mean, I'm, I'm not even kidding. So the, Lisp is the, the one language that has said the first and the last word in so many fields, it's, it's pretty much amazing. Um, it has introduced garbage collection when it was almost impractical to do it. Uh, it, it, it has introduced uh, functional programming. It has introduced you know, a lot of notions that people have uh, ever since rediscovered many times over. So I wish I had invented Lisp. And I think one of the only other appropriate answers on this panel is scheme. <laughs> <laughs> Scheme is a, is a lisp. Yeah. <laughs> I would say uh, COBOL, actually, because why not? I don't think anyone else is going to take responsibility <laughs> for it. It's yours. You can have it. <laughs> uh, 
No, really, actually, yeah, I agree. Lisp is, is really it. It all goes back to Lisp. You know, you, you can't argue with it. If it wasn't for Lisp, we'd all be uh, programming in descendants of Fortran. Uh, some of us still are, but it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, why don't we go on this side again? One up here, maybe? Um, I'll give you this. You know, one of the challenges I see is um, I really love the expressibility of languages like Lisp or Clojure or Haskell. But one of the challenges is uh, when you're working for a corporation and you're trying to find people who do that work, um, it's really hard. It's hard to find people with experience, but it's also hard to find people who want to I, I would say push themselves to that higher level. You know, is there something you could do, if you could do something, what would it be to help, I would say, I don't know, raise the, the reading and writing level um, that we currently have that's prevalent and, and make it higher for the programmers in general, say, that are coming out of school? Actually, I don't think you solve the problem that way. I mean, I think it would be great. I think people really should spend a lot more time you know, learning more. Uh, but, you know, there was a time when Java programmers were rare. Right? There are going to be new things, and new things are, it, they're, you know, it's hard to find people to fill them. Uh, what has to happen is people in decision-making positions have to be empowered with a good rationale for doing something different. When they are, they'll make that decision. They'll, some of them will have to get over that hump of early hires, and then when there are jobs, people will learn what they need to learn to get the jobs. Yeah. One of the things that's been an observation over a long time is that it's often to your, more to your advantage to be like the person next to you than it is to have a better tool. And that's why I think a lot of this, a lot of this inertia in, develop, in getting systems that are slightly unusual adopted in any reasonable way Um, well, just pragmatically speaking also, I mean, sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Um, yeah. If you're working, you know, especially if you're working in a managed environment like the JVM or, or .NET, um, you know, being able to factor out various components into different languages that are appropriate for the task is relatively straightforward. Um, and also, few things speak louder than production code. So sometimes it just means just go ahead and get the ball rolling. And then, you know, if the code is there and you need someone to maintain it, um, you know, they'll learn it if it's part of the job rather than, you know, train them up on it as well. Um, so actually, I've spent a significant part of my career, most of it pushing emerging technologies and trying to get people to adopt them. And I guess one of the things I've noticed over the years is that um, um, in practice, real real organizations that actually have to do a job don't pick a new technology just because it's a neat new technology. They, they pick it because they have something that they perceive as an insurmountable problem that they need to have a, a solution for. And, and it looks like here is something new that might be an alternative, and that causes them to take the risk. So I, I really think it's, it, it's a pull from there's some problem that needs to be solved and what people have. So you got to find that problem. You got to find that niche. Uh, I actually, in the early days of small talk adoption, I think what was actually driving it was there was a lot of enterprises who felt they had to build applications with, with rich user interfaces, and they got the ideas that you need needed objects, and small talk was a way to do that. To, to do that, because they really didn't care about object-oriented programming. They just wanted to put windows on the screen. Um, my sense is much of Java's traction came about because it was very cleverly connected to the internet, and the internet was just bursting on the scene, and these organizations felt that they had to do something that was relevant to the internet, and they were told Java was it, and so they, they, they tried Java. So that's the sort of thing that, that really, I think, drives adoption. Um, on a personal level, I think it's a matter of uh, giving personal example. Um, I've seen many times people claiming, uh, you know, why don't you guys, uh, why don't you use this uh, this new uh, technology technique uh, approach paradigm, etc. Um, at the end of the day, you need to demonstrate uh, that whatever uh, you know, a new knowledge you're using, you know, unusual knowledge you're using, is going to make you much more productive. 
And for me personally, this, this has worked historically. Instead of, uh, instead of you know, whining about it to, uh, to people, why aren't you people learning about this uh, great thing uh, that, that I'm using, um, I focused on being more productive while, while using it. And you know, people are going to, to make the connection. Oh, so you know, the, this, this, this thing is, uh, is making people more productive, so I'm going to start using it. So um, uh, definitely there is a component from, from the top down, and you know, the, the Java story is definitely a, a, good, uh, a good anecdote of that. And there's also a story of, of the grassroots uh, kind of approach, which is, yeah, if, if you think something is better, uh, use it and be better while using it. I think it's also worth acknowledging how amazingly little lock-in there is in terms of technical choices when you're talking about code compared to almost anything else, right? It's not like you have a factory and all your tools won't fit the new widgets or your train tracks are a little bit too wide for the new kind of trains and you have to tear up the whole thing, right? It's often the case where you can deploy a small piece of your entire application in Clojure or in Scala if you want to try it and just make it interoperate fairly easily. Okay, why don't we get a question in the back up here? Yes, I see that hand back there. So it seems like there has been a cyclic evolution of programming languages uh, and uh, features such as, or concepts such as uh, functional programming, object-oriented programming, dynamic typing, or static typing have come in and out of fashion. And I'm wondering if you expect that cycle to continue, and if not, how do we break out of it? Um, so I have an answer. Um, that's the nature of humanity. Whatever is currently in vogue, whatever people currently are using, at some point in time, some, somebody or some group of people starts to break out and say there's got to be something different. You know, if there, there, if there is no new emerging technology, there's nothing for language designers to do, nothing for consultants to consult on. So, yeah, I think the cycle is going to continue forever. It's what, whatever is the, the established technology, there will be new technologies that are trying to break in and displace them. But hopefully it's something a little bit more than just fashion, right? It's not like, you know, your low-rise functional programming is in this season and then <laughs> well, next week. Well, because well, well, I mean, you have, you have cycles of human interest, but at the same time you have this sort of march of technology that is kind of going in a direction, at least it so seems to be. Ab absolutely there is, is a march that things, I think, do get better. But there is a lot of fashion involved. I mean, I've, I've seen enough of, of, of that. I've seen enough of these cycles to say, to a certain degree, this is, is simply you know, the neat new thing, and so that's why it's being followed. I don't think it's cyclical at all, and I think the main thing is that the technology is driving so fast that almost everything we do becomes obsolete rather fast, okay? The reason why, the reason why functional programming has come into vogue in some places is because now you have machines that can actually do it reasonably well. With, you know, something like Lisp is a memory hog, right? It's, it's obviously true. And so the, the, the fact that we're going to have machines with millions of cores or whatever, which I think is true, is going to, is going to require completely different ways of programming. And that's going to require no, totally novel ways of thinking. So I don't think we're really in that loop at all. Yeah, exactly. I, th I don't think we should be focusing on the languages. I think we should be focusing on the problems we're trying to solve. Um, you know, the problems that are, I mean, there is a, a certain amount of fashion in language choice today. But I mean, the problems we're trying to solve today you know, are, are maybe better suited to, to certain kinds of languages or certain, certain approaches to problem solving. Um, which, so necessarily, since we're all facing these problems, you know, we tend to look to those tools. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's so much cyclical. I think that it's just that, you know, certain problems are more important to us at certain times and certain tools are maybe more appropriate for coming up with solutions to those problems. Um, Indeed, I, I agree. It's not cyclical; it's spiral, um, because it cycles and it goes back to where it was, except with, you know at a different uh, point in a third dimension. So, um, you know, if you if you follow um, uh, you know any aspect of our industry, you're going to see that it follows spirals. Uh, look at operating operating systems are a great example because uh, it's been like microkernels. And then uh, exokernels, and, and it, it's going on and on. And you know, it, virtual machine monitors have been invoked, like in the 60s, like VMware, right? And uh, you know, this this has been going on and on in all fields, like storage, any any anything, databases, storage. It goes on and on. You know, it, it counts. And that's because the trade-offs in our hardware are changing. There was a time when all memory access was free, was one cycle, right? 
was one side because it was one transistor, then the memory bus was one wire that was like two meters long and stuff like that, right? So uh, don't cut that wire. That, that's a memory bus. You better don't cut that, you know? So um, there have been times when memory access has been wide cycled because the process was so, so damn slow. Because, you know, and then the um, uh, process got faster, memory is uh, lagged behind, and uh, the trade-offs keep on changing uh, on us. And that's why different architectures and different, uh, uh, di different trade-offs uh, change over time. I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a mere matter of fashion. That being said, it, it is a spiral because, uh, for example, there's been great progress in, uh, in, uh, uh, in programming language theory and practice in the past uh, 20, 30 years. Um, thinking, you know, that there's things that uh, that are just uh, that are just great that have been done, and definitely there is uh, there is real progress there. And if if, for example, um, a functional approach comes comes with a vengeance because now you, you can uh, you, you have a much better uh, grasp on mutability, control mutability, you have a much better grasp on paralyzing things, you have a much better grasp on uh, you know on things that made functional programming historically difficult. So uh, definitely, I would agree that uh, th there is this notion of uh, things coming in and out of vogue, but they are driven by real market and technological forces. So I think that actually connects back to the earlier question about what we're going to do to address, you know, having thousands of cores um, on a chip, because there seems to be both, you know, in the industry and then also among the kinds of things that we're saying, a lot of focus on having languages that are there to fit the technology of the time, right? How are we going to use our languages that can adapt to this, you know, million core world. But at the same time, I think it would also be good to have a focus on languages that are focused on the problems and not so much, you know, saying, oh, now we have new hardware, let's write in a language that fits the hardware but doesn't necessarily fit the problem. So, you know, because problems, sometimes they arise just because of the hardware you have, right? You've got a 10, a 20 cluster storm server and now you need to figure out the reach of all of your tweets and maybe that wasn't your problem before you had 100 machines to run it on. Um, and in my particular case, with uh, sort of um, New York Times projects, it's often not at all something that, that needs to be, you know, highly concurrent or highly scalable. It's more with dirty data, right? You have a terrible data set from the government you have to clean up, or you have a whole bunch of really cruddy documents you need to connect in some way. And it's much more about, you know, sort of scripting and being able to express it clearly than it is about any kind of performance or type safety or reliability. So I think we need to look at both. Okay, I think we're out of time. Do you guys have a question for the audience? Maybe not. All right, let's thank our panel.